Okay, so um, before I, I'll introduce myself at the end, but I'll just go ahead and walk down the panel, kind of introduce uh, who we are. The nice part is we have an hour. Um, I was, if I look from here from the standpoint of, I was on the panel for the last uh, event that uh, Connectpreneur had on blockchain, and I was actually the panelist. So I get to uh, flip the script a little bit and be the one who gets to ask some of the questions uh, and kind of change, you know, figure out where this conversation goes. Uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, piece. And so we'll start here, kind of walk our way down, just go ahead and introduce yourselves, tell kind of what you do and kind of relate it to the blockchain section of kind of the conversation for today. I imagine some people know what Consensus is. Uh, my name is Sam Cassett. I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Consensus. Uh, I was there in the very early days, in the, in the beginning of Consensus, when uh, Ethereum was not yet finished. Uh, a lot of people thought it was an ambitious project uh, and weren't really sure that it would be finished, but we uh, eventually got comfortable that it would be. Uh, I, I was there with uh, Joseph Lubin, who was one of the founders of Ethereum, and, and so we had some, some good insight into it. Uh, and we looked around and we saw that, you know, this is a little bit like 1991, uh, and there are, we know that this HTTP thing is going to be really interesting and really valuable, but we don't know anything else. We don't know what a web server looks like, we don't know what a browser looks like, we don't know anything. Um, but yet we had sort of Snapchat and we had Google in our mind and we saw the future, uh, but we needed to build all the steps in between. So consensus set out uh, to build a lot of things at once. Uh, for the business people in the audience, building a lot of things at once is not usually a good way to make a startup company. Uh, so we thought maybe we should make a venture fund. Uh, we thought it was too early, actually. A lot, of the, a lot of the entrepreneurs, a lot of the companies in the ecosystem, we felt were too early, too immature, were taking too large a bet, too much platform risk. Um, so what we did is we designed a venture studio, which is sort of somewhere in between, where we build companies hands-on, we fund them, we get them to the stage where they actually make sense, and they can stand on their own two feet, and they do that. Uh, we used a bunch of application level things across a lot of different industries, a lot of different verticals. Uh, I can go into some of those later, but uh, we used a lot of application level technologies to motivate all the infrastructure. So right now, we build pretty much the, the dominant platforms for building, for maintaining the DevOps infrastructure, for deploying pretty much anything on Ethereum. Um, I think we serve about 5.8 billion transactions a day to the Ethereum network. Um, and so uh, that's the general structure of consensus. Since then, we've, uh, asked to, we've been asked to consult for governments through the official blockchain advisors of Dubai, Fortune 50 companies. We helped spearhead the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, which is the largest blockchain uh, industry consortium. We have a venture fund. We have an educational institution. We're all over the place. We're in 30 countries. We have 20 offices. I think we're around at about 800 people. You guys are doing just as much. It's as confusing as blockchain is for a lot of people to figure out. All right, uh, next. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eliza Wens Wensley. And, uh, so I'm the CEO of Databook. And uh, basically what we do is we empower consumers to be able to control their data and possibly monetize it if they choose to do so. Um, so right now, a lot of you guys are probably seeing in the news things with Cambridge Analytica, um, how your data is being moved, um, you know, being sold, it's being bought by whoever. No one has really any control. So we're trying to change that. And right now, data brokers are making around $250 billion every year um, selling data. And we're trying to bring some of that value back to the consumer so that you guys can get compensated for the data that you choose to share. So yeah. Next. Hey everybody, I'm John Wise. I'm the CEO of Loki, uh, also the co-founder of the Digital Asset Trade Association Data, which is a lobbying uh, firm as well as a uh, trade association. Um, on top of that, also the founder of Top Tier Affiliate Group, um, an entrepreneur in residence for multiple funds in the uh, area, as well as an LP and a couple of other funds. Um, what Loki does, which is really my, my main project, uh, is intellectual property on the blockchain. Right? We're, we're essentially uh, creating a way to circumvent the patent offices all around the world, create a new exchange and a new marketplace for uh, getting immediate liquidity for intellectual property um, at the idea stage itself, so the inception uh, stage. Um, we feel that's one of the, the root stores of value of, of uh, all economic growth is uh, intellect itself, the other two being um, materials mined from the earth, uh, and effort from anybody, machines, or an, any other sort of device. Um, 
That's, that's pretty much it. I've, I've been in crypto and, and blockchain since about uh, April 2010. Um, I kind of forgot about it for about uh, eight years and, and got back in, or seven, seven years. Um, and then, you know, was building a, building a business uh, since 2008, really. Um, then realized that the, the fit for intellectual property and everything that we were doing just made perfect, perfect sense. Um, really did a lot of studying and a lot of research on uh, economies, markets, um, especially macroeconomics. Um, and now I'm one of the lead. Uh, Thanks. Now I'm one of the lead uh, macro economists for for several uh, regulators and and uh, international governing bodies. Very good. Next. Hi. Um. My name is Daniel Lee. I'm the co-founder of Secure Identity Ledger Corporation. And what we do is we uh, we created and operate our own uh, private permission blockchain. Um, when we actually uh, started to doing this, we actually take a look at some of the uh, uh, current uh, public blockchain and some of the open source to see if we can build our, our applications on top of it. And we had two applications in mind. The first one is a digital ID product, and the second one is an asset manager to sort of count the number of tokens or whatever else you wanted to load. Um, but when we actually went out and we looked at the, 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 uh, the two operating public blockchain, Bitcoin, which is great for transaction, we found out that the miners and a couple of other things make it uh, really difficult for us to really uh, modify, to change a couple of things. Then we turned our eyes to Ethereum, and we found out for the smart contract aspect of it was fantastic, but we really don't, can't get started with a, uh, an account-based type of uh, identity management where the, your, essentially your public key is, is uh, publicly available. So at that time, this is around uh, November 2016, we actually looked at Hyperledger. And this is before their release of Fa Fabric One. And we found out it was just too confusing. Everything was working inside of a Docker. So we said, so I got a bunch of coders and it started with four of us. Uh, at that time we said, hey, is, we're gonna do something bold and crazy. How about we try to take bits and pieces of everyone and why don't we build our own blockchain? And so we set out to do that, and that was the beginning of 2017. And around May, June timeframe, we actually completed that. And so we built two primary things. We built a digital ID. Uh, so we generate a digital ID, it's 15 digits. Uh, can make it more or less or whatever. Uh, we generate a, ser a series of keys, uh, public and private keys associated with that ID. And then from then on, we are able to use that digital ID and the associated keys to now allow us to collect uh, information as well as to tokenize uh, the exchange of data. Um, and first we said, okay, would that would work inside of a, uh, an organization? And we found out, yes, it would. And then we said, well, can we do it uh, outside of an organization? And then when we found out, yes, that would work, but we need to create an asset manager. Uh, the asset manager, you would have to keep track of all of these exchanges and uh, whether or not uh, you know, to promote uh, trust and uh, transparency and all this stuff. So we, we set out to build that and by around October, time frame 2017, we said, okay, look like we built something, so what do we do next? This is during the boom of the ICO. And we're like, well, you know what? We're not quite ready for an ICO, so why don't we take a bold move? Is there any way that we can integrate this and let's test it against a really fast, um, uh, network out there. So we said, you know, we're a bunch of around sitting around having a pizza, and we said, hey, why don't we test it against VisaNet? And I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. So why don't we sign up with a bunch of merchant processor, and let's see if we can exchange values and money back and forth and tokenize everything. So that's what we did. Uh, around October, we got a chance to test our uh, blockchain against VisaNet. While it's not a very, um, it's intermittent, we were able to get, uh, the surprising thing is we actually were able to sell our digital ID product in the tune of around $65,000. We found out that people were willing to pay for a digital ID. And the weird thing is that we found out that the price point was anywhere that we got someone paid for as much as $25 for a digital ID all the way up to $150 for a digital ID. We're able to generate all of this. So I went back and I told my group, and I go, hey, when we loaded all of this thing in, besides capturing all these tokens from Visa and everything, did we actually load it onto 
any type of blockchain at all, guys? And they said, oh yeah, everything is loaded onto a blockchain. And I'm like, really? So we went back and we looked at it. By hold, we did. And we recorded everything, even the mistakes, uh, the misspell, everything. Every aspect is loaded into the blockchain. And then around October 24th, we had a very uh, scary uh, email from Stripe and a couple of payment providers. They said that you guys violated the term of use. You have, we're gonna kick you off. So I'm like, hmm, interesting. So they kicked us off, they go, so well, our network is not prepped for cryptocurrency or any type of blockchain. So they kicked us off. But by that time, when they kicked us off, they didn't let us know, and we had a catastrophic crash on Amazon. So, and I'm like, oh boy, that's not a good way to start off this thing. But when we went back, we were able to piece our blockchain back together. Time, sequence, everything all in place. And I'm like, wow, you know what? I think this blockchain is pretty resilient. Let's, uh, let's uh, test it out on the open market. And then we looked around and we got all the feedback from all of our users to, uh, that went on. So we tweaked a couple things. We tweaked our interface. We tweaked of how the people can get on and get off the blockchain. And we also tweaked in terms of what information is loaded onto the blockchain. And by then we said, okay, but we have to stop short. So let's build into, let's stop here and allow other people to develop the smart contract aspect of it, as well as the DAP aspect of it. So we just provide our blockchain, a fundamental blockchain, a digital ID product, and an asset management counter, and then let everybody else develop. And that's where we are today. I just came back from London in terms of the blockchain conference. I think the market and everybody is starting to warm up in terms of blockchain. And that's why when I, had, when I got an opportunity to fill in at the last minute from TN, I took it. And I'm like, here's a great way to sort of express when everyone says, there's no such thing, there's no utility, there's no use case. We are working on at least four use case right now. And we find this a very exciting time and very challenging also. And just like our, our previous speaker, finding developers is very hard. So if anybody wants to work, don't work for them, work for me. <laughs> Or, or Thank us. you. <laughs> Last but not least. Um, I'm Cynthia Trager. I'm the CEO of Pacific. We spun up about 30 years ago as a proprietary software and a hardware uh, manufacturer and provider. And in 2006, we became a technology and media holding company. About three years ago, uh, we started fooling around a little bit with blockchain and dis distributed ledger. And um, we've now built a platform for the defense, aerospace, transportation, and on the commercial side, sports and entertainment industries uh, that does some pretty interesting things. So, happy to discuss. Very nice. So we have a very wide range of uh, not only companies, but backgrounds and kind of roles. Uh, that's kind of why I'm here. Uh, what I say, I, I translate the geek speak uh, around technology and emerging technology. So I get to speak around the world uh, about 70 events uh, this year on emerging technologies, marketing, social media, uh, blockchain. Uh, I have a background in cybersecurity from uh, the Department of Defense. I worked at a BA Systems for about nine years uh, out of the Pentagon on the DOD um, cyber side. But one of the things I think that's really interesting in this space is that the last panel that I, I mentioned earlier um, that we had a couple months ago, I guess maybe it was probably six months ago, uh, it was probably one of the longest lines I'd ever seen after an event of people asking questions, concerned, and one of the biggest questions they would say is, we've heard about blockchain, we've, we've heard crypto, but we had no idea it was going to impact our industry, right? It's, it's, it's happening over there. So I'm curious for the panel, I'll let anyone jump in kind of first. When you're looking at like kind of, the, you know, we're talking on this panel, the survive and thrive. So I think understanding, we've, we've gone through some crazy times, understanding where the technology is. But how do you kind of, you know, settle the waters when people are saying, okay, how is this impacting us today? Because I think that was, most of the people in that panel were like, wait a second, do I need to change something, you know, back in my servers, how I'm setting up my user configuration today? Or, or do I need to, just something I need to be aware of? So how do you answer that question on kind of where people should be thinking about blockchain as of today? I think they ought to try to put themselves out of business every day, right? I, I think as, as a founder, that's, that's what we're supposed to do, and I think that's Bezos that coined that term, right? If you're not waking up every day trying to figure out how to put yourself out of business, somebody else is. Um, blockchain's coming. It's here, right? It, it, it's been here for a while, cryptocurrency as well. Um, I, I, I think we're starting with, with financial markets. Um, 
but it's going to continue to expand, right? It's going to continue to expand for, for data asset management, for intellectual property, for transactions. That's really just, just the beginning. Um, everything down to voting registry, property deeds, it, it, you know, anything along those lines. Um, any, any transaction, any time something needs to be audited and confirmed uh, after the fact, it's, it, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, that being said, there are some people that are getting really creative, right? Um, things like Snapchat makes actually a lot of sense for, for, a, for a token. They have a really horrible time trying to raise uh, or, or monetize their, um, their ads or their um, little filters. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then on a broader spectrum, it also makes sense for businesses like Uber that, that transact in multiple currencies all over the world, right? They're, they're all over the place. They somehow need to funnel it back into a centralized bank and then distribute it out from there. Uh, the transaction fees end up just becoming burdensome, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they need a token, but they need liquidity and they, they need to be able to move this stuff around. They need to ease the burden. So um, from the idealist perspective, most of us say, oh, you know, you don't need a token for that. Well, it's true, but it's a multi-hundred billion dollar business or whatever it is, right? It would save quite a lot of effort and, and quite a lot of money. So going further, I, I, I think it's kind of, the, the onerous is kind of on founders and the, and the business people and the strategy officers um, to think on their own about this, right? It's, we're happy to, to field any questions, right? Consensus is, especially has always been a very good informational uh, um, sort of output there. Yeah, I, I think uh, to your question, you know, is this something we need to worry about in our back end? No, uh, immediately, but it's more of a question uh, at the strategic business model level. Uh, you know, I was, I was on a global call recently with a bunch of CEOs of companies and, and I was asked, you know, if you could put something on the gravestone uh, of, of traditional business, what would it be? And I, and I said, here lies the intermediary. Um, be, because, you know, essentially what, what this technology does is it allows trust to be placed into a, um, a third party that isn't controlled by any particular party, right? That's why banks might want to create a blockchain between them. I, you know, JP Morgan doesn't trust uh, Goldman to tell them how much money they owe them, um, but they need an intermediary to do that, right? And they use, they use uh, exchanges or they use the DTCC to do that. Um, I might need uh, a lawyer and a court system in order to adjudicate and correctly, uh, you know, correctly administer the rights claims that various people have to various monies or various other goods or, or whatever it is. Uh, and, and the reason I am willing to pay taxes for that and the reason I'm willing to pay lawyers for that is because they are, our society has chosen that those things are trusted entities and, and, they're, uh, and they're capable of administrating these, these claims. But now, uh, if I have a piece of technology that by definition, no party owns it, and by definition, it's going to execute exactly according to the agreement that we make between the counterparties, uh, then suddenly all of, all of that machinery of trust I don't need anymore. And so I would say, you know, if your business involves being one of those intermediaries and extracting rent as the value flows through your value chain, um, then you should be worried about your business. Um, I think there, there are dozens of new business models emerging that also have to do with incentivization as well, uh, where I can get crowds of people to perform some kind of action, whereas before I would have had to set up some kind of marketplace network and I would have had to create the network effects and, and you know, probably bring other businesses onto the platform, et cetera. And now I can launch a token that has certain dynamics and incentivize behavior. So for instance, we have a platform called Civil uh, that incentivizes people to um, you know, not emit fake news, <laughs> essentially, uh, and, and it does that partially through its, its token dynamic, uh, and there, you know, there are dozens of examples of that. Uh, but I think it's certainly at the business model level, and it's certainly at the, um, is, is the, the rent you're extracting for your intermediation the right size? Is that, is that the correct market price, or, or has the market discovery mechanism found that price? And if not, you're in for a change in your structure. So one, one quick caveat to this, just by the way, I've got to steal that, that gravestone thing. That's, that's brilliant. Um, intermediaries, 
specifically from a perspective of extracting rent on being the intermediary is, is really the, the biggest place. Um, there are still some markets and still some businesses and, and really some industries that need to have anonymity but yet have some, some audit and, and tracking. Um, those businesses are going to get impacted as well, not, not necessarily just businesses that, that already uh, are extracting rent from a market as being the intermediary. There are some industries that need to have an intermediary, um, whereas the, the, the decentralization of a valuation of things can, can also really impact those spaces. Uh, um, our, our business, for one, I mean, I'm quite an idealist here from, from decentralization perspective, um, but intellectual property is something that the, you, you really can't completely decentralize the whole thing, not with existing regulation, not if you really want to make any change. Um, so the way that we did that, right, was uh, specifically about decentralizing the valuation of, of the IP. The, essentially, we don't hold any of the cards, we, we don't hold any of the keys, and we don't extract any rent. Yeah, well, one, one of the feedback that I got in, in terms of how to thrive and survive, to answer your question, is that be bold. Um, you know, it, it could be as simple as us sitting around eating a pizza and we said, hey, um, are we going to launch a token? We had no idea. We was like, well, you know what? Why are we launching a token? Let's just throw our thing out there and let the public, the, so we can get feedback. Right now we have no data, no basis of whatever it is we're doing. So by the time that we finished launching our product back in October, um, the blockchain, the first blockchain expo, Santa Clara, uh, we went there and we were starting to hear the re recurring theme of MVP, minimal viable product. You guys need to get something out there, get the uh, public to give you a feedback whether this is useful. Is somebody going to buy it? Do you know the price points? Uh, what are the things you guys are going to develop next? And from just that conference alone, when I got back, I went there with uh, one developer, and we said, you know what? We have a couple of issues. One, we're going. How do we? Uh, we have to address the phishing attack. Uh, we have to address also the uh, the the problem with the wallets. Uh, holding multiple currencies. How about integrating multiple wallets? Is there any way that we can make it easier for? Uh, to create a DAP? Uh, is it easier for them to load any type of uh, contract, whether it's the ERC-20 or an Ethereum or any other contract? And these are the things that only if we release our, our, the users that actually got on our platform, they start to ask us. And without a product, I don't think we would be able to do all of these things. Like I said, now we're actually working on some of these issues. How do we address the phishing? Uh, the creating a, a multi-sig wallet uh, that can hold multiple uh, currency. And how do I really make it so the authentication and the sign-on process doesn't have to be uh, username, password base? Can it be behavioral base? Can it be uh, 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 location base? And how, how do you, as a user, actually know that whatever you leave in the blockchain, it's private, no one can steal your funds? Well, I think on a broader scale, you know, as an industry, if we consider ourselves to be the blockchain distributed ledger industry, if you will. Uh, we spent a lot of time parsing contractual language and dropping it into code and dropping it onto our platform. It's something we run into on a regular basis, weekly, monthly, uh, is regulation and the promise of yet more regulation to come. And I think one of the things that we need to do as an industry, if we're going to survive and thrive, is educate regulators and governments as to what the technology really is, what it really does, and start dispelling some of the myths so that we can keep regulation at bay, because that's the biggest boogeyman that we have in the process right now. I, I think, though, at, at bay has a certain uh, <laughs> ring to it. Uh, I, I, I think, actually, Having regulation will reduce risk, right? If I'm an investor looking at this space, if I'm a big incumbent, uh, I want to know that there's regulation, to know that I can do business there, and if I put a billion dollars or $10 billion there, it's not going to evaporate overnight. Um, not to comment on that too much, but I would encourage people, we, we have something called the Brooklyn Project. It's the Brooklyn Project at consensus.net, uh, and that is the forum that we're using to spearhead a lot of the conversations that are happening right now between federal level legislators uh, and regulators and uh, the industry leading lawyers and, and companies. So all the companies in the room, all the lawyers in the room, regulators in the room, uh, please join that conversation because I think a lot of good work is happening there. 
Yeah, so um, I think everyone up here kind of touched on the business side of things, but I kind of wanted to answer your question as far as the consumer side, um, what do they need to know? And I would say, I, I talk to people all the time that they're like, yeah, I know what Bitcoin is, I don't know what blockchain is. And I'm like, okay, well, let me try to explain it in like five minutes, which is pretty hard to do if you've ever tried to. And I would say, just talk to people about, it. tell them what it is as best you can, because maybe they're not starting a business right now, maybe they're not in the blockchain space or thinking about going into it, but maybe they know someone that's going to, or maybe eventually they want to start a business that, hey, don't start that because it's about to be disrupted. So kind of just be transparent about it. So I like this conversation. You know, I worked in cyber, and I, one of the things I hated about cybersecurity was it, it was an all or nothing play, right? You had a four character password that didn't work. You went 30 character with no words, no phrases up, you know. And then, you know, in the cloud computing space, I was working in that space. One of the things I thought was a massive issue with cloud computing was that when uh, Apple came out with, you know, their cloud, uh, it really confused the market. And I think when we're looking at, you know, translating what's going on here, I. I don't like relying on marketers. I think marketers are the ones that make it a little bit more confusing, especially um, in this space. And I'm a marketer, so if you're a marketer, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of blaming myself for a lot of this. But if we looked at something like the Facebook issue that happened, I, last time I was on this stage, I made the comment that said, I kind of hope something happens to where it attracts attention to privacy and the idea that if you're getting something for free, you're paying with your data. So when you guys saw, and I think as a collective, like when you looked at the Facebook drama that turned into, to me, a lot more than really what it was, because mo probably most of us realized this has been going on for years, but when my mom is calling me and saying, what apps do I uninstall? How is blockchain going to fix the, my Facebook problems? And, you know, can I still play those apps if I'm using blockchain? I'm like, wait, my mom's talking about blockchain? Like, how did that happen? And it, for me, it happened because of something like Facebook. So when you heard kind of that, so, what were your thoughts as a, as a I was, yeah, I was celebrating only because, yeah, it, it sucks that this happened, but I'm so happy that people are starting to get educated about this. I, before Cambridge Analytica and all of that, I had people that thought data just meant their email and phone number and address. And now they're like, wait, my data is my location. And so if I download this free app that like just does something stupid, that means it's tracking my location. Or if I give my um, email and my address to Domino's when I move, like, oh, they're selling that because they want to be the first people to have that new address of mine. It's like all this crazy stuff that people are now finally getting educated about. And I'm happy about it. So. Surprisingly enough, um, when I started uh, Data, Digital Asset Trade Association, with, with our co-founders, um, a couple of them were actually involved with Cambridge Analytica at the time. Um, it was, had specifically left Cambridge Analytica to, to start a trade association and an awareness uh, association about doing exactly this. So we were actually one of, the, one of the ones that started the Know Your Data campaign, uh, hashtags, uh, and, a, and a bunch of other stuff. And, and to speak up, we've actually been working with the Brooklyn Project quite a bit, uh, as well as Coin Center and, and uh, Digital Chamber of Commerce. They're really focused on the federal level for the most part. We're doing a state-by-state -state level. Uh, we're the ones that did uh, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Tennessee, and we've got about 13 other states here that are, that are coming together. Um, kind of been behind the scenes intentionally for, for exactly this. But, uh, privacy is a real issue, right? And I think the reality is, is that there are those that kind of wait and hope for things like this, right? And then there are those of us that say, well, screw it, let's go and, and make something, right? Because we see what's happening. And, and I think probably everybody in this room sees and understands most of what's going on, right? Especially around the, the intelligence community, the defense community. We have an understanding of how much is captured. Right. We, we get it on, on a larger scale than most people recognize. Um, it's kind of up to us to do something about it and not wait. Um, we, we have the technology. We now are, are on the main stage. We have the, the eyeballs of most of the world, right? And now the industry has pretty good money to be able to make this happen as well. Stop waiting. You know, fund a project that you feel is doing the right thing or get involved or work with them or, or do whatever. I was, I was pretty 
happy when I saw that actually, not because of what happened obviously, but uh, because it's a wake up call, right? And I think anyone who works in marketing or in technology in general, if you understand that technology deeply, what, what CA did like isn't actually that weird, happens all the time. Um, and and, and for, for that moment when you know, your average person sees, it gets explained to them what marketers do every day and, the, and their mind is blown. Uh, I said, you know, this is, this is a watershed moment for uh, identity in blockchain and specifically you know, our product Uport and, and these new notions of identity uh, that are surrounding the space, so good. <laughs> Yeah, well, one of the things that we addressed uh, regarding privacy and everything, and um, we said, well, how can we protect people? Um, the best thing to protect is whatever you store uh, at a minimum, and if you have to collect anything important about them, let's hash it. They know what it is. You, all you have is a hash. So you come into our network, all you're going to get is a bunch of hashes. You already know your email, you know your phone number, you know all of these other aspects. So what we tried to do is we tried to address the problem. And this is from the feedback of when we actually launched an actual product. They said, how do you know what my data looked like? We actually have to create a screenshot of when people enter something. It turns into a hash. And I say, if you don't believe what we hash is correct, take it, copy it, and paste it, and go check it. It will show, come out to be the same thing. For those that don't know, a hash, by the way, is basically just confirming that there's only one of something. There's no duplicate, right? You're, right. you're basically just just looking at the, the entry of one thing. You're not actually looking at the data. And I mean, I think for those of us that watch the Mark Zuckerberg questioning, it was almost as apparent as the uh, Cambridge Analytica news was how disconnected those asking him questions were, which, you know, I think for, from my standpoint, came back to this education problem, right? And I think every business, no matter what industry you're in, you're in the business of trust. And we have a trust problem. And unfortunately for a majority of consumers today, they look at the trust problem as I'm either relying on someone else because I would rather not care and I'll put my head in the sand, or I'm gonna be so overcorrecting that I'm gonna have two, you know, two-factor authentication on, then I get on an airplane, I can't log into anything, and I, I can't listen to my iTunes, so I turn everything off. So I think this is an interesting conversation. I think we've heard the word trust, privacy. We've heard the, the, you know, the idea of education. When you look at this kind of thriving as we move forward, what, what's the things that are going to start? Where's, where's this education going to come now that we are seeing it on big stages? One of the things for me that was exciting, uh, I'm keynoting an event, a social media event in, in three weeks in Atlanta, and they messaged me about a week and a half ago and said, we're putting a blockchain panel in this event. And, and just to put this in perspective, it took like you know, probably eight years for social media to put, talk about cloud computing as a whole in, in that kind of space. So I think we're looking at that as exciting, but when we're looking at this piece, like, you know, we have trust, we have privacy, we see the Cambridge Analytica news, uh, crypto being a little bit volatile, depending on where you're looking at it. Where, where, what's the step forward? What's the thing that, okay, we were happy that Facebook happened. What's something we would love to see happen next to kind of start pushing this ball even further and going from this stage to, you know, a, a bigger place where TN can, you know, sell out, you know, 3,000 seats? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm speaking in a couple of weeks here at multiple events that have 15,000 people attending. So, uh, I mean, I spoke in Davos, I spoke uh, at, um, I forgot the, the one that was in Vegas, the big finance one, Money 2020. Yeah, there's, what, 20,000 people there or something. I, the fire marshals ended up closing the thing down. Um, it, it is already the main stage. Um, and I, I think really the next steps are, are global regulation, global sort of conformity here, because th this is not a state-by-state -state level issue. This is not a federal issue. Um, it's not even a money issue. It's not even an awareness issue, right? It's, it's a conformity issue, right? Um, I, I think this thing's large enough that it's going to eat it all. And, and anybody that, that doesn't want to get on board is just getting it steamrolled. Um, frankly, this is kind of happening with how slow the U.S. has been to, to issue regulation. The U.S. is getting steamrolled. Um, by China, by Russia, by, by even island uh, nations, right? They're Malta, Gibraltar, um, you know, some, some of the smaller com uh, countries like Papua New Guinea are, are starting to have dramatic increases in their GDP. Um, it's a big problem. So uh, the U.S. especially kind of needs to get on board. A lot of it comes down to, to the way that 
that commodities are traded and global economic systems are, 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 are transacting. Well, yeah. some of the goodness that came out of the, the Zuckerberg hearings was the fact that now, as Americans, we understand the concept of GDPR, which, if we adopted it in this country, would not necessarily be a bad thing, right? So the rest yeah. of the world, I think, to a large extent, is, is on board. And as stubborn as we are as Americans, you know, we're still dragging our feet. Um, How familiar is everyone here with GDPR? Do you know what it is? Raise hands. Okay, so um, right now in Europe, uh, there's GDPR, which basically allows you to get um, like a copy of your data. It allows you to go to a company and say, just delete my data. It gives you pretty good control of your data. So this also is for companies that are based out of the US that have European customers. So if um, you know, you're Swedish and you have whatever account that's a US company, you can go to them and actually ask them to delete your data or get a copy of it. And I think having that being brought to the US, if that was to happen, I think that would be groundbreaking. So I think, you know, and this is interesting because I think most, you know, especially foreign countries, when they look at technology, they always caveat and say we're five years behind the U.S., we're two years behind the U.S. So it's kind of a little bit of a flip on that where not only are they in front of the U.S., but they're in front of the U.S. from a user education perspective, um, even from a standpoint of, you know, users kind of pushing that forward. But I also, you know, kind of we have to remember where, you know, where we're dealing at it, where we're moving the needle. I also think inside of the Beltway, we have a different view on regulation here than I think a lot of the rest of even our, our the own. U.S. does, you know, moving forward. So when we look at, you know, something as simple as education on the difference between what blockchain is and what Bitcoin is, right? The, I think that's one of the biggest things is that they oftentimes get interchanged in conversations. How do you guys kind of attack that kind of conversation? Or maybe what's the problem that you first address that you're solving that maybe, you know, for me, I think people leaving this room and they say they went to an event about blockchain, they're going to get questions. That's, that's exciting, right? We can probably thank Cambridge Analytica for that, you know, spurring questions about blockchain. But how are they answering what's the problem that it's solving or what's the, you know, the exciting thing that you're kind of seeing in your individual space because I think we have a very unique uh, you know, backgrounds in this group. I, I like the analogy of the global trusted computer. Uh, if you have a global trusted computer that no one owns and no one controls and therefore you can trust it because it will execute according to its, its programming. Uh, Bitcoin is one app. It's one app that functions on a blockchain and therefore enjoys those same properties. Ethereum is the computer itself that you can write any application on. Uh, and you could write the New York Stock Exchange on it. You could write a supply chain tracking tool on it. You could write all of the publishing and monetization and advertising of Facebook on it um, in a way that has a much different dynamic than the existing uh, order. Well, so we're based in DC. And we've been around for a long time from the technology perspective. And we've always been a few years ahead of the curve. And one thing that we learned many, many years ago was that we could drive across the river and spend time with legislators actually bringing them up to speed on what the promise of technology that is coming is going to do. And early on, the first question we always got was, what are you here to sell? <laughs> it was tempting at first to try to sell something to a legislator who, A, probably has no budget, B, probably doesn't understand what we're telling them. And so what we had to do is kind of rethink that process. And we've made it part of our internal DNA to spend time educating the industry and those folks that regulate us as to what, what these new promising technologies are and why it matters for them to actually understand how you put data and information into context, how it affects their constituents, how it affects the markets, and what it kind of means to us all. So if you're DC based and you're not spending time on the Hill, I'd say you're probably not doing the best business that you could be doing for your company and your industry. I, I just want to tweak sort of one assumption I think that's implicit in your, your last question. And you know, I think that regulators around the world are actually really educated. And I, and I think there's a dynamic that's emerging, that always emerges, where you know offshore jurisdictions like Gibraltar and the Channel Islands and you know Malta and 
and uh, Bermuda, actually, Premier Burt in Bermuda can sit down at a table and argue the, the, uh, the specific execution of an Ethereum smart contract with you if you want. Um, you know, those, those jurisdictions, one thing that they have is their sovereignty. Uh, and that's why hedge funds are structured there. You know, lots of the reinsurance industry in the world is structured in Bermuda. Uh, it's in their interest to be very educated about this stuff. And so that's, that's happening, and, and there's probably some regulatory arbitrage happening. But I think it's a mistake to say that the US and Europe doesn't have extremely educated uh, regulators. So, I mean, if you walk into the SEC right now, uh, people are very sophisticated. Uh, the, the issue is the rest of the world follows what the US does from a regulatory perspective, especially financially. Uh, and so they have a, a big burden on their shoulders and, and uh, I applaud them for doing a, a good job and not coming out with something reckless. Um, you know, what happens when you do something reckless is like New York, uh, where you know, most, most businesses would never put themselves in New York if they deal with blockchain uh, because of the bit license. So, I, I think we're actually in a pretty good place. I just wanted to say that. No, I like that. I think you know that's you know I, I always say that you know no technology will fix stupid, uh, but we can do a good job of kind of educating that, right? So you know blockchain won't fix stupid either. And I, I would love to take some questions. We have about uh, 15 minutes left. Uh, I'd love to take some questions from the audience. You know I think this discussion a lot of it is education, trust. But I would you know from those that are here, you guys are spending your time. Uh, go ahead and throw your hand up. I can probably run a microphone up there. Oh, we got right down the middle. Uh, of course, we're down the middle. Go ahead. And decide, what about regulation? Decide from government. Institutions like banking and financial institutions, aren't they uh, a roadblock to regulation? Trying to stay, for, stay with the old regime in order to still make money as opposed to go to a different world that they're not used to? I don't know if I'd agree with that. I'd say that. The banking and financial services industries are very progressive. And you probably have better insight into that than I do. Yeah, I, I think both, right? I mean, you have Jamie Dimon out there saying Bitcoin's a scam, and then uh, you know a few weeks later saying, I'm sorry I said that. It's not, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a scam. And actually, JP Morgan was one of our founding partners of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, and they developed Quorum, which is, you know. You know yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Making a billion dollar VIG in the meantime by, by the way of trading quite, quite a lot of other things. But. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. So, um, so yeah, I think it, dep it depends on, you know, there's certainly some old guard within certain institutions, but at the same time, you know, many of the largest financial institutions in the world are, are in the, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. A lot of them are developing their own technology and are pushing the forefront of this. There was a time several years ago when I felt afraid that that would happen. Uh, and I think that time has passed because uh, they realized that this is a way for them to make their own processes more efficient. It's new areas of business to explore, and it's also a place they could be disrupted if they don't uh, act. Yeah, um, I, I speak with regulators almost every day. Um, I, I've been speaking with a lot of banks as well, um, especially, so again, we, we do the state by state level. Um, I have yet to see anybody really resist. Um, usually what it comes down to is something like money transmittal law, money service businesses um, from state to state transference. But for the most part, these banks have international interests as well. Um, and they also have to do a lot of disclosures. They have to do a lot of due diligence uh, and a lot of compliance checks uh, on a constant basis. It's very inefficient. It's very uh, expensive for them to do all this stuff. and and. Uh, being pro blockchain in, in many respects ends up cleaning a lot of this up and, and it ultimately just comes down to aligning the interests right uh, of the citizens of the people of the regulators uh, the banks and, and business so uh, a little while ago one of our uh, known intermediaries in NASDAQ has basically said that they would like to be the uh, exchange place for cryptocurrencies it was just maybe about an hour ago they announced this um, any comments to that with the death of the intermediaries? Um, so really, let, let, let me preface by saying I think I was one of the cri first crypto businesses to do a, a live NASDAQ interview. Um, they've been interested for a while. Uh, th this was maybe a year, year and a half ago or so, and then I did another one a few months ago. They've been really interested for a while. The, the biggest thing that they're really interested in is not necessarily being an intermediary. They're, they're, they're trying to be um, 
kind of a main stage exchange for securities, uh, security tokens, uh, things, things along those lines. Um, also keep in mind that, that CME, uh, Chicago Mercantile, and, and CBOE are also doing the same thing on the commodity side. Um, this isn't really that new of a concept. There are multiple other exchanges out there. Uh, the Toronto Mercantile, uh, multiple Canadian exchanges have, have publicly traded uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, and internationally there are 30 or 40 of them doing, doing the same thing. Um, it, it, it's not that they, they, they don't actually really take much of a VIG. They, they're, they're taking a, a, an initial filing fee. I think right-sized intermediation is, is the right way to think about it. I mean, if, if the rent you're extracting is appropriate, then it's okay. Uh, it's just that these tools make it more difficult to extract outsized amounts of rent. Um, and I think there's, there's a general trend towards that, and they're smart to jump on that. You may have seen uh, Circle, who is partially backed by Goldman, um, recently bought Poloniex, which is one of the biggest kind of uh, non-mainstream token traders uh, exchanges in, in the U.S., uh, probably the largest that, that listed kind of weird uh, ERC-20 tokens, Ethereum tokens, etc. cetera. Um, they were bought with the caveat that if you turn yourself into an ATS, which is an alternative trading system, which means that, you know, much like NASDAQ private markets, you are a, not a mainstream, not, not a New York Stock Exchange, but you are a uh, a, an alternative trading system that is allowed to, to trade securities uh, but is a secondary market or is a different kind of market. If Polo agreed to be turned into that, then the, the SEC would uh, forget what may have happened in the past. You know, as, as we get closer to regulatory clarity about what it is that is not a security and um, you know, what kinds of exchanges and what kinds of licensures are, are necessary, uh, to trade different things, uh, th there will probably be a place in the market for, for that, and I think they're smart to, to approach that. As, you know, and Goldman and Circle aren't stupid either. More questions? Oh, we have one right here. Uh, the microphone died. We're, blockchain has to take our microphone. Okay. Uh, so, um, how many people here, uh, John, I know you know Perry Ann, how many people here were actually on the first blockchain day on the Hill back for, like 2014? Did anybody attend that or know about that? Okay, yeah. hey, so, so I was there. So one of the things that my question is, is that the first time blockchain and Bitcoin was actually introduced on the Hill back in 2014, when Perry Ann Warren from Digital Chamber went up and did like a, hey, here's what it is today. We were out walking around just kind of handing out flyers and just trying to say the word to people. Right, get get it, get the awareness. So now we come kind of full circle, and the question now is: Okay, regulation has a cycle, right? So like people like a Delaware Corporation, because there's a body of law to basically enforce regulation. So in the U.S., we'd like to be a leader. And I think one of the things that we have as advantages is, is like the, the Howey test was basically you know, set from the Supreme Court, right? So in, in looking at what the U.S. needs to do to be a leader. And, and provide regulatory leadership, it has to go to this global level, I think, right? So, so if I would ask the panel, how do we look at regulation, because there actually is an enforcement arm to it, but how do we then kind of, you know, recruit kind of global partners that also are not just the Channel Islands or Gibraltar or Malta or something. We actually have to have a little bit of an enforcement arm for the larger institutional investments to feel comfortable to do things. So how do we form that global partnership that has safety for big money to come in, Regulation that kind of is universal at some level, and then some level of enforcement that gives investors confidence that should something happen, there's a way to kind of go about it, like pooling or something like that. It's a very broad thing, but that's what I'd like to see. For us to be a leader, we have to have some sort of global, you know, alliance. So define regulation, because there's financial considerations that are regulated by certain entities and certain agencies. There's privacy regulation, there's medical and, and HIPAA regulation, which we deal with all the time, not just in the US, but around the world. So define regulation, so we can help you a little bit. I just meant, you know, look, there's a, there's a little bit of, you know, regulators right now, whether it's agency to agency, SEC, FINRA, CFTC, uh, DOJ, you know, they're all kind of looking to kind of see where they land, and there's a little bit of a discussion, right? Who's got jurisdiction from the U.S. point? So I'm just like, how do you get up to a higher level? John, uh, yeah. you talk to these guys, so. Well, yeah, and, and, and so does Sam. Uh, um, what it really comes down to is 
it comes down to case law. It comes down to thought leaders um, trying to come up with these these ideas, these concepts. A lot of this was discussed at World Economic Forum. Um, it, it really comes down to, to to people fielding the ideas, right? Groups, trade associations, uh, uh, companies getting out there and discussing this stuff, and then a couple of bad actors, right? Wh whether it be in Malta or whatever else, um, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica did it for, for data, right? Um, th there have been, um, I think, Goldman Sachs and, and Deutsche with, with mortgage-backed securities, right? Th these are, that's essentially what it is, is it needs to be case law where we can say, ah, we didn't realize that that was an exposure until now. And I think really, you know, with how much financial and regulatory burden rests on the U.S. as far as making it as, and setting an example globally, um, they really don't want to mess up, right? There's, there's a really big burden, and, and the U.S. is just way too slow to, to, to fix this stuff very quickly. Um, so we're looking, I, I, I think, for enough examples of bad actors that that, that box can be mostly defined and then we can say okay this is this is where we can go yeah kind of agreeing with you on that i think that it's a lot of um, just pushing it's a lot of people that are just going to have to push boundaries on what they're going to try to do and then it's regulators coming back and saying wait a second let's figure something out because you can say all day yeah we're all just going to sit at a table and you know figure this out in one day and it's going to be great does that always happen? Not really. It's a lot of the times, like he's saying, bad actors or people just pushing the boundaries. It's reactionary. Yeah. That's the challenge. What is what's prone and what's reactionary? Yep. It's a cycle of that and then it's decimated. Mm -hmm. Yep, so exactly. What, what, you had mentioned that. You had mentioned the Howey test. I mean, the, the, the Howey test came from exactly that, right? It, 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 right. it, it came from. So, yeah. one, one thing that we're trying to get industry people to do is behave in a self-regulatory manner. You know, you know, the idea of creating a global regime, I think is partially impractical and difficult and maybe scary and dystopian. But, uh, but the idea that you know, a model of right behavior can be uh, portrayed and, and enacted in law and, and then replicated depending on the particular market, um, spearheaded by people who really understand it, uh, in an SRO kind of capacity, that that makes a lot of sense. That's why Japan has such forward-looking uh, regulation, is because there's a self-regulatory uh, body there uh, among all the players and the exchanges. Uh, and so, in the U.S., you know, our our, our token launches that we do, for instance, uh, all of our uh, behaviors are things that we believe and have have well-reasoned uh, logical lines uh, between the goals of, of regulators and the goals of existing uh, financial regulation and, and our behavior, right? And, and we can kind of draw the, the connections for them. And I think if we could get the industry to behave in that way uh, and, and be upstanding, then it's fairly easy for uh, regulators around the world to see how that all fits and, and, to, uh, and to be comfortable that there aren't going to be a lot of bad actors. And if you see actors out there that are just blatantly violating uh, the the things that everyone else believes to be appropriate, then it makes their job a little bit easier too, and it just makes everyone more comfortable. So, um, I, I think having model model behavior and model rules uh, that then are, are appropriately adapted is the only way to make it global. And we've set up things like the EU Observatory for Blockchain, for instance. Uh, we advise uh, governments all over. So, uh, I think that's all you can do. Yeah, uh, well, one of the things that we try to do uh, as a company is be transparent, be responsible, don't be a bad uh, actor, um, and execute, execute in your plan. Build something to, so that the, gen the general public have an idea what you're trying to do, and then, you know, this is where I sort of lean over to the Uber approach. Let's, uh, let's get some mass, let's get the adoption, and then the regulation, I'm sure it's going to, to fall in line. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's going to be things. We don't know what's going on. We don't know how, how this is going to shake out. The best thing to do is we need a couple of leaders that are out there to start to execute and, you know, and be transparent. Well, you bring up a good question because one of the things, one of the positions that the chamber has right now, the digital chamber has right now, is regarding potential legislation coming in from states for smart contracts. And that's the last thing we need 
right now is for 50 states or X number of states to start regulating what happens with smart contracts when we already have regulation at the federal level that covers us, right? So it's, a, it's an excellent question. As an industry, I don't know how we fix that problem short of you know, engaging with lobbyists and trade associations to help communicate that message, but it's something that we follow regularly. And candidly, it, it, from a business risk perspective, if states start legislating what happens at the smart contract level, it's gonna have an impact on what we do globally. And that's, that's an interesting, I'm actually working with a, a cannabis company and we're trying to link the, uh, the struggles <laughs> from cannabis legalization Absolutely. and from a, a blockchain side. We're gonna release a paper on that and that's coming from a thought leader side. It's just kind of, hey, what can we learn from regulating? I think one of the hardest parts to this question is we have a tough time regulating what we've known about for 20 years. <laughs> now, we, now we've thrown a brand new technology that's gonna disrupt all the technology that it took us you know, to move from on-prem to cloud computing was a nightmare. Not even figuring out how to get there, but then once we got there, what do we put on cloud? And just because I can't touch it, it's not secure. So I think you know, we have a lot of these hurdles. I think it's exciting to see where we're at. I think all of you, from a leader perspective, it's exciting. I leave this event just from the, this morning's discussion in this panel thinking, hey, we are, we're at a good place today. We still have some work with education. We have some work with regulation that we know that we need, but we have some things that are falling in place that I think are, are exciting across the board. So uh, I think that's all the time we have now. So uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, applause for our...